Wednesday, we looked a little bit more into uh, this uh, book of Philippians, the epistle of Paul to the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And I love this book so much that I just decided that we'd keep going through it. And hopefully, Pastor Craig will be back next week to uh, continue his exposition of the word. But we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 12 through 13. And as you're turning to that passage, I want to address something that we frequently run up against in Scripture when we're reading, when we're discovering the mysteries of God and how God has revealed himself in Scripture. We often find that the God who's revealed in Scripture is a God we don't fully comprehend. That when God is using language, when he's using human ideas to tell us about him, There are ideas that come into conflict in our minds. There are ways that God reveals himself that don't fit into our categories or that don't fit into the way that we think about reality. And a lot of time when we look at these passages in scripture that seem to hold contradictory ideas, we come face to face with a God who is infinite, a God who loves us deeply, but who is so far above our comprehension that it's difficult sometimes to grapple with this God, to wrestle with God as Jacob did right as he was about to meet his brother Esau. is this wrestling with God that is difficult. Is this wrestling with God that can be frustrating sometimes, but is out of that dealing with parts of scripture where we don't understand what, try, what God is trying to say or see con- contradicting ideas that we learn the most about God and we learn the most about his scripture. But the danger that we must not fall into when we see contradictory ideas in Scripture is taking out those difficult ideas that don't fit into our worldview. Or taking out those parts of Scripture that present challenges to our understanding of God that make our understanding uncomfortable. There was this Greek myth that was told a long, long time ago about this man named Procrustus. Procrustus was a bandit who lived out in the countryside in a road that connected two very large cities in Greece. And what Procrustus would do is he would invite travelers into his home for the night. But what he would do after he invited them in was something very gruesome. He would lay them on top of an iron bed of his. And if, they, if their height did not match the bed's length, then he would either stretch them or cut off their legs to make sure that their height fit the bed. I don't know how this hasn't been made into a horror movie yet, but let's thank God that we haven't had the pleasure of seeing that on TV. But Procrustus would take something, or take someone that didn't fit his specifications, and would destroy them, would injure them, would cut them until they fit what he wanted them to be. This is often the approach we take with scripture. This is often the approach we take with the oracles of God as God has revealed himself to us in scripture. When ideas come into conflict with each other, it's a lot easier for us to just ignore certain parts of God's revelation rather than grappling with the fact that the God that we worship is a God who we cannot fully comprehend. But we must not lose hope because the tensions in scripture will be those places where we learn the most about God and where we are led to the most worship of God. And it is these two verses that we're looking at that provide many tensions, several tensions, several seeming contradictory ideas in Scripture. But if we are patient, if we take the time for the Holy Spirit to convict us and to show us what he is saying, then we will be the richer for it. We will be the closer to Christ for it and we will be the more effective in ministry for it. So with that groundwork laid, that the God that we read about is often a God that we don't understand at first, we come to the scripture, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, which reads like this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now the context of the epistle epistle to the Philippians, as you'll recall from last week, is that Paul is writing this letter from prison. 
that the weight of this ministry that he has, this compunction that he has to go to the nations and tell people about Christ, he cannot fulfill the way he wants to because he's stuck in a Roman prison. And because he's restrained, he's writing this letter to the Philippians in order to tell them to stay the course, even when he's not there. Because the God that we serve is the God who is working in us actively so that we can worship him, so that we can want to please him, and so that we can act so that salvation can come to sinners, so that the gospel of Christ can be proclaimed. So the attitude that we should adopt in the midst of that is not an attitude of laziness or an attitude of complacency. Because the scripture says that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling because of the weight of the call that we have. The weight of those sinners who, like us, would have been going to hell if it weren't for the gospel of Christ. Sinners like us who need to hear that there is life provided in Christ. And we must take it to them. Let us be careful lest we tarry, lest we delay, lest we stop working to see Christ proclaimed and magnified among the nations. But as we act, we should always act, we should always serve, we should always preach the gospel with an eye towards Christ. We should never act in a way that's not worshipful. We should never act out of our own flesh or out of our own effort. We must look to Jesus, not just to provide us the power to act, but in wonder and worship for the way that he served us. We looked last week at this hymn of Christ that's laid out in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, which places Christ as the standard of service and sees how he served us even unto obedience to death, death on a cross. The death that purchased our redemption, the blood that bought our salvation, That's the standard of service that we have. So when we serve, we shouldn't serve in a way that makes us look better. But we should serve because Jesus sought to serve us by dying on the cross, by offering his own life for us. So when we act, when we serve, we should have an attitude of worshipful action. That when we act, we're worshiping God. Not just when we're singing, not just when we're playing music, not just when we're listening to worship music. It's when we're acting that we should be worshipful and engaged in this worshipful action. But Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13 presents a lot of difficulty. Because it presents certain contradictory ideas or seemingly contradictory ideas. And there's three tensions in this scripture that I think at first cause us to pause. And the difficulty may drive us away from looking at what's inside the scripture, from looking at how we can serve God more closely as a result from, of reading the scripture. But if you would allow me to carefully walk with you, that you would explore with me this passage, I think the three tensions that it outlines will drive us to worshipful action, will drive us to Jesus, and will drive us to act in a way that glorifies him more and more. So the first tension that Paul outlines in verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. The tension that Paul outlines first is that we must not only obey, but we must obey more. The way an old friend of my father's put it is that When we pray, we don't just pray, but we pray. If it just sounds like I'm saying the words over and over again, it's supposed to bring us to this picture of we often get into this cycle. We often get into this sense of I have my spiritual disciplines. I have my ways that I serve. I'm just going to keep doing that and not progress and not do more for the Lord, not because it gains me any righteousness, but because it brings him glory, it's often tempting to just obey rather than obeying much more. And that's the tension that Jesus had to correct the Apostle Peter in when he came to him and asked an interesting question. It was just after the cusp of Jesus talking about forgiveness, talking and preaching about how we should forgive 
as believers. But Peter comes up to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and asks him, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? And if you will permit me some speculation, if I were Peter and I was asking that question, I would be asking it as a lowball question to Jesus. Because seven times forgiving somebody, that's a lot. Forgiving them once would be generous. Forgiving them twice would be close to letting them walk all over me. But because I'm holy, because I'm in the inner circle of Jesus, because I want to impress him, I'm going to ask him, what if I forgive him seven times? But Jesus sees right through the facade. And he calls Peter to a higher level of obedience, a higher level of service when he says, not seven times, but 77 times. Jesus is not impressed by Peter's initial action, initial portrayal of righteousness because it's not Christ's righteousness. He's not impressed with our act. He's not impressed with us trying to live out of our own flesh trying to please God in our own effort. He's not impressed by those things because it's our righteousness that we're trying to develop, not Christ's. And it is Christ's righteousness that Paul is calling the Philippians forward to. A lot of the epistles that Paul has written were epistles written to really problemed churches. Churches that were deep in sin, deep in false doctrine, whether it was the church in Galatia, which was moving over to the circumcision party and was seeking to gain their own righteousness by following the Jewish law, whether it was the church in Corinth where their worship services had no order in them and where they were given to sexual immorality, so many churches that Paul planted or that Paul ministered to lacked true doctrine or lacked a sense of drive to follow the gospel, to preach it, and to follow and obey the Lord. But Philippi is not like that. In fact, in verse 12, Paul says that they have always obeyed. When he was there, and when he's been hearing about how the church is doing, there doesn't seem to be a lot of cause for correction. But Paul doesn't stop with just a pat on the back. Paul is not content to just let the Philippians continue at their sustainable rate at the way that they've been going, but he calls them to even more in his absence continue to obey and to obey more, to submit more, to strive more that the gospel may be preached among the nations. The church of Philippi is not perfect. They're, fel- they're fairly healthy, but that's not an excuse to let up in their progress of holiness. So it seems at first that Paul is talking out of both sides of his mouth. If the Philippians have truly always obeyed, then why is he telling them to obey more? The reason that Paul is telling them to strive on, to not be content with their current level of holiness, is that we do not grow in holiness so that we can hold up a mirror to ourselves and bask in the light of our glory. We grow in holiness because it glorifies God and we keep pressing forward. And we'll have permission to stop growing in holiness when we can say what Jesus said said in John chapter 8, verses 29. I always do the things that please the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but with the sin in my life and the complacency that I often treat my own spiritual life with, I am not at the point where I can say with Jesus, I always do the things that please the Father. So I want to strive, I want to obey more, not because I purchase my own righteousness, but because the joy that is had with obeying Christ, the power that he fills my life with as I continue to try to obey him, continue to try to please him, that joy is something that I will continue to grow in for the rest of my life. Because Christ's righteousness is an infinite righteousness which means we will continue to grow in our love for Christ and our ability to obey him more deeply, more joyfully, and more effectively the longer that we strive forward. But that is something that we will forfeit if we stay where we are. 
So don't be content at your certain level, your, your current level of holiness, but continue to strive forward. Now that does not mean fill your life with a bunch of good works and good acts so that God will be happy with you. Because at the end of the day, if our works are based on our effort alone, so that we may please God because we're good people, then we're getting it wrong. Luckily, Scripture tells us how we are to grow in the image of Christ, how we are to grow in holiness in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2-3, through 3, which says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So John here doesn't say that in order to purify yourself, you need to donate to charity. Paul doesn't say that in order to purify yourself, you have to attend church faithfully, although those are ways in which you do it. But the common factor by which we purify ourselves is by looking to Jesus. In the same way that we look to Jesus for our salvation, that it only comes from him, so too our sanctification, our process of growing in our relationship with God, only comes when we lean on Christ and we look to him and his perfect purity, his boundless love, and his passion that his name would be proclaimed so that sinners may come and worship him. So we grow in him by looking to him. And looking to him is a lot like looking at a magnificent painting or a mountainscape. And I've been places where I'll look at a mountain or I'll look at a scene of nature and I think that if I can just look at it long enough, I'll figure it out. I'll see every detail that there is to see, but the longer I look at it, the longer I want to look at it. In the same way, when we look to Jesus, we're not going to exhaust the joy that comes from seeing his beauty in a lifetime. We're not going to exhaust the joy that comes from seeing his beauty in eternity when we get to be with him. Which means there's a deep well of contentment as we look to the beauty of Jesus, our Redeemer. As we meditate and we dive into the ocean of his love and grace, there's just deeper and deeper and deeper to go. But if we are content just to obey, just to stay at the surface, and we won't see the depths. So Paul calls the Philippian church to not just obey in his presence when he's there, but to obey much more in his absence because there's a depth of love, of knowledge, of grace that a thousand lifetimes could not exhaust. So let's press in. Let's obey much more. Let's seek out our Lord and Savior much more than we did yesterday. And see the depth of joy, the depth of beauty that awaits those who truly search after him. So that first tension is resolved between obeying now and obeying more when we look to Christ. And see his infinite perfection in the way that he wants to mold us into his image. So moving on from the first tension of obeying now and obeying much more. The second tension that this scripture outlines is that we receive salvation freely, but we work it out in fear and trembling. Before knowing Christ, the fear that characterizes sinners or that should characterize sinners is a fear of God's wrath, a fear of God's condemnation and his judgment because we know that sinners apart from Christ, apart from the loving work on the cross, will be separated from God forever. So the fear and trembling that we should experience as unrepentant sinners is not the same as the fear we experience as Christians. Because God promises that he adopts us into his family. That we become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're not afraid of God's wrath. His infinite eternal wrath towards sinners towards us because that has been exhausted and paid for on the cross. So what is it that causes us to go into fear and trembling? 
And further than that, what's all this business about work? Isn't salvation apart from works? Don't we gain salvation in a relationship with God, not from anything that we can do, but solely on Christ's sacrifice? You would be correct in saying that. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 is clear on that matter. That we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, but by the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. The scripture is also equally clear in James chapter 2, verse 26, which says, As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So there's this infinite debate which has been raged throughout the generations. If we receive salvation freely, then what is the role of works? And there's one word that Paul says that resolves this tension. In verse 13, or verse 12, he doesn't say work for your salvation. He doesn't say work towards your own salvation. He says work out your own salvation. To put it another way, work from your salvation. Forgiveness of sins is, in Christ is something that you receive freely. And the work that we do to grow in our holiness of, our holiness much like God, much like Christ, is something that we continue to labor towards, but it is on the foundation that Jesus laid. It's on the foundation that Christ laid of his grace by faith in him. The way commentator Matthew Henry puts it is that it concerns us above all things to secure the welfare of our souls. Whatever becomes of other things, let us take care of our best interests. It is our own salvation. It is not for us to judge other people. We have enough to do to look to ourselves. So what Matthew Henry is saying is that the work's not done. Although Jesus said it is finished on the cross and what he said was true, that our salvation was secure, that we don't need to do anything to earn our salvation, save place our faith in him and receive that salvation by faith. The work of being formed into the image of Christ in our life now is not over. Unless you can say with Jesus that I always do the things that pleases him, there are still more ways that you can submit to the Father. There is still work to be done to submit to his will, to grow in our joy and our contentment in Christ. But that work that we do is not based on our foundation that we built. It's not based on our own righteousness or because we're good people. It is only because Christ has purchased us by his blood. So when we act, when we serve, when we obey God, the only way we are able to work in the first place is because Christ has purchased us. Because we have placed our faith in Christ and he has saved us by his blood. So any work we do is derivative of what Christ has already done. And we proceed by faith on Christ's sacrifice and Christ's sacrifice alone. So if that salvation that we, we receive is free... And the working out of it afterwards is something that we build off of Christ's foundation, then what is this business with fear and trembling? Joseph Thayer, a man who lived in the 19th century who wrote a dictionary of Greek words, said that the Greek here for fear and trembling was used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability to completely meet all requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Therefore, this tension between the salvation we've already received and the working out of our salvation, which we must continue to do, is resolved when we distrust our ability to produce our own righteousness. But that just as you depend on Jesus for your salvation, so also depend on him for your obedience. Let your worship of him expose your inability to please him at all apart from faith and compel you to depend on him in all of your actions. May the way that you see your salvation is totally from him, and the fear and trembling that you approach the work that you have to do to grow in Christ draw you to worship and to depend on the Lord. Because at the end of the day, 
this problem that we have of sin, the power may be broken. And the penalty of it may be gone. But sin is still present with us. We still struggle as Christians. We still struggle to please God. But the hope that we have is that the penalty of sin has been paid for. Which means when we run towards Christ, we run based on the cross. And that cross will never fail. It hasn't failed me. And it won't fail you. It's strong enough to hold your sin, to pay for it. And it's strong enough to hold up your salvation. So work it out with fear and trembling, knowing full well that your efforts apart from Christ are useless. So we've looked at first how we obey now and then we obey much more. We looked second at the tension between receiving salvation previously and working it out in fear and trembling. And finally we come to possibly the most curious tension that Paul lays out. And it occurs in the bridge between verse 12 and 13. Where he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So the tension here is that we are responsible for growing in holiness, but we can't do it on our own. At the Shepherds Conference in 2010, which is a conference for pastors, John MacArthur was commenting on, uh, John MacArthur, a very famous pastor in California, was commenting on the tensions that he feels when he looks at scripture and when he lives out his Christian life. And he eventually in this outburst just said, I don't even know how my spiritual life works. If we were to ask ourselves, who lives your spiritual life? Maybe some of the more pious among us would raise up and say, well, it is the Holy Spirit living in me. But I'm not sure if we would want to blame the Holy Spirit for some of the sin that we live in our lives. And John MacArthur pointed that out and said, that though we may say it's the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't want to blame him. We wouldn't want to give him the credit for the sinful things that we do. And then he moves on further and quotes Paul in Galatians 2.20, the King James Version, and says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Paul didn't know either. So in that same way, where this mystery of how salvation is worked out in us, this mystery of how we continue to grow in Christ, is a mystery where we work as hard as we can. The Greek is the same word that we get the word agonize from. We agonize. We work hard. We struggle so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. But we know that it's God working in us the whole time. And this isn't the only place that lays out this tension in Scripture. There's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6, where Paul says there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10 says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. In Colossians 1.29, Paul says, For this goal of seeing Christ glorified among the nations, I toil, struggling, agonizing, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. The debate between God's primary role in our sanctification and our primary role in our sanctification has raged throughout the centuries. And people usually fall into one of two camps. There's quietism and pietism. Quietism describes those people who say, I have no role in my sanctification. It is only the Spirit working in me. Some of the phrases that individuals like this will use are phrases like, let go and let God, or I can't, God can. And while those have an element of truth, the error that they lead us into is that sanctification, following Christ, has no effort from us at all. But the other error you can fall into is pietism, which is where we are totally responsible for our holiness where Christ has already paid the sacrifice on the cross. So now it is up to us entirely to work from that. 
But both of these are examples of Procrustes who seeks to fit people to his own specifications. If we don't look at the scripture and let it define what we think, we'll be tempted to warp it to fit our own perspectives. So which is it? Is it us working out our salvation or is it God? The answer is yes. And if that answer doesn't satisfy you, I'm not sure it satisfies me either. But I am content to know that as I struggle to be more like Christ every day, that God is working in me to form me into the image of Christ. So the Holy Spirit dwelling within us develops the image of Christ in us so that God the Father may be glorified. Paul's not there to teach the church in Philippi, but the Holy Spirit is. Just like Jesus wasn't there physically after his ascension to continue to teach the apostles, but he promised the Holy Spirit. He said that we would be better off for it. And if we believe the promise in Scripture that when we have placed our faith in Christ, we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, then we know that as we're seeking Jesus, as we're working hard, giving everything to grow in holiness, it's not us primarily working. It is God working in us as we work. But this isn't just esoteric, in-the-clouds theology. This isn't just things that we would talk about in seminaries or that scholars would debate about in their armchairs. We must press forward and ask, how on earth does that work practically? If it's I and God working, God working in me so that I can work, how does that work practically? God gives us guidance. In Mark chapter 13, verse 11, when he says, when Jesus says, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. There's not a lot of time for sermon prep when you're being carried off to prison or where you're being carried off to trial. But Jesus gives comfort to the apostles when he says, speak what you're given. You must speak. You must proclaim the gospel, but it won't be you. That even if it feels like it is just you, even if it feels like it's just you enduring suffering, it's just you going through this hardship, it's just you enduring the trials that we have for us in this life, it's not just you. That when we submit to the Spirit and we act to please Him, it is actually Him working in us. So He gets all the credit for our sanctification, but we are working it out with His empowerment. The way John Piper puts it is that Christ empowers our will to want to do what He wants. Other guidance is offered in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge him. And he will make your your path straight. You acknowledge him, he will make your path straight. You continue to follow him, he will ordain your direction so that you glorify him. And then finally, Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. The very steps, the very next minutes, when you're faced with uncertainty, when you don't know what the next day is going to look like, when you don't know what the next step even to take is, the counsel that we receive from Scripture is that we trust in the Lord, that we delight in him first, and that he'll take care of the way. So as we're trusting the Lord, as we're giving ourselves to him, God will empower and direct us in his way so that we can focus on walking towards him. So for you, continue to pray. Continue to read scripture. Continue to worship God in the midst of hardship, in the midst of not knowing what your next steps are. Your future is under God's authority. So be careful lest you meddle in God's business. Our business is to glorify and to praise Christ now. His business is to direct our path and our future that we may glorify him more.
So we see in the final analysis that even as we're working hard for our salvation, it is God working in us. So how do we take this text, which deals with these seeming contradictory ideas and the tensions that Scripture outlines, how do we take that and live from it? I'd offer three suggestions for application to work out this text in your own life by the power of God. The first is, don't settle. We have not arrived. Christ has not returned yet. Though, by God's grace, maybe he'll return today, maybe he'll return tomorrow, maybe he'll return this week before Pastor Craig. Maybe. But until he does, let's not settle. Let's continue forward. Because there is greater joy and contentment in Christ that we are forfeiting if we stop now. If we stop growing in our love for Christ now. So the first is, don't settle. God is working in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Don't, so don't settle, because God doesn't settle short of Christ. God didn't settle short of Christ when he called Christ to die on the cross for our sins. So let's not settle either. Secondly, as we think about how God works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure, if you feel that you lack the desire or ability to grow in holiness, if you look at the image of Christ and find nothing in you to compel you to want to be like Christ, if the discipline that is required to know Christ and to love him is something that frankly turns you off, the comfort that this verse provides is that it calls us to resolve to pray regularly that the Spirit would help us be like Christ. Because the verse doesn't just say, verse 13 does not just say that God works in us to work for his good pleasure. That God works in us to will it, to want it, to want to be like Christ. That's not a natural desire. We don't naturally want to be like Jesus. But as the Spirit works in us, when we pray and we submit he will create that desire in us. So pray. Resolve to pray until the Lord grows that desire for holiness, for Christ-likeness in you. God must work in us if we are to be holy. Our knowledge of and adherence to the law or to rules or to religiosity comes from the flesh if it's not empowered by faith and it will not please God. Only the work that God starts in our hearts and that we carry out by faith and dependence in him is going to carry us to Christ-likeness. And God promises in this text to give us the will to grow in holiness. The way a close friend of mine put it, and she led a Bible study that I once went to, is that God commands it because he can supply it. God commands the impossible because he can create the impossible in us. God commands us to be like Christ, to be holy as he is holy, because he can do it. And we can't. Not without his help. Not without his working in us first. So with that in mind, this fact that we cannot do this without God, ask for God to give you the will to carry on. So first, don't settle. Second, resolve to pray that you would receive this desire for holiness. And finally, when you serve, not if, but when you serve the church and the body of Christ, serve because Christ served you by dying for you. Don't trifle with reasons like it seemed like the right thing to do. Or any person in my position would do the same thing I did. In your service, Worship Christ. Give him glory for what he's done. And when you serve other people, don't let the devil gain a foothold or boost your pride by thinking to yourself, I'm demonstrating my own holiness. Because when we act for God, let us act for God. And let us serve and worship Christ even when we're serving other people. So as this text calls us to worshipful action, worship should not just be confined to the music that we sing, but in the life that we live purchased by Christ, seeking the depth of his love that we could not exhaust 
over a thousand lifetimes so that we may grow into the head of the body, and that is Christ. Worship without action is not true worship. And action without worship is not holy action. When Paul compels us to look onto Christ, let us look onto him and depend on him, not just for our salvation, but in our following him, so that we can grow in the endless love and bask in the infinite glory that is Christ and God glorified in him. As we close our time together and continue to meditate on Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, I ask that you'd bow your heads with me as we close our service and we approach the Lord for a final song of worship. But let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and consider. God means for you to live as Christ did. But if you have not placed your faith in Christ, then you do not know the depth of beauty. You do not know the depth of love. You've been looking for other things to fill that hole, but nothing's going to fill that except for Christ. And even if you don't want Jesus, that desire is something that the Spirit can grow in you. So if you recognize that you're a sinner and that you need to have your sins forgiven, but you don't know how to come to Christ, call out to Him. Ask for His help. He does not expect you to pay for your own sins because He's paid for it on the cross. So place your faith in Him. Believe that he can bring you into salvation. But if you have placed your faith in Christ, if you feel the Spirit in you, if you have any participation in the Spirit, any love or comfort, then know that God works in you to develop the image of Christ, to love him more, to serve him more, and to see souls saved by your testimony. It's not of you, it's of him. So let's pray as we close together. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for the promise that we do not live our Christian life by ourselves, Lord. But that we live empowered by you and built up by your, by your grace, Lord, and by looking to Christ. So Lord, I pray for the people here, the people hearing my voice, if they have not placed their faith in you. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you would convict them of sin. That they'd see that they need you desperately, Lord. And that they would run to you, Lord. That they'd place their faith in Christ's finished work on the cross from this day forward, resolve to live for you by your work in them. Lord, I pray, I pray for those of us who have maybe become complacent, who have thought that we have obeyed enough and are not obeying much more, are not seeking to love you more. I pray that you'd forgive us of our complacency and our lack of love for you, that you would stir in us a desire to be holy. Lord, I pray that you would work in us to will and to act according to your good pleasure that you may be glorified, that souls may be saved, and that the name of Christ would be lifted up for the salvation of many, for the redemption of all creation, so that we can stand before you and give you glory for what you've done for us. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Amen.